Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the launch of Making Kin, Eco-Feminist Essays from Singapore. Thank you all so much for joining us on this Saturday morning. And we're really excited for the conversation that will be taking place today on eco-feminism and kinship. So we'll be taking live notes for those who would like to follow along. And you can read the live notes at bit.ly slash making kin launch notes. I think you can see the link in our Facebook um, comments. So the editors and contributors of Making Kin will be speaking for about 45 minutes and there will be a live Q&A after. And we're taking questions on Slido. So you may post your questions at www.slido.com slash making kin. And you'll be able to upload, uh, upvote similar questions there. And we'll try to answer as many questions as we can before the end of the program. So I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have the co-editor of Making Kin, Esther Vinson. Esther is the editor-in-chief and founder of the Tiger Moth Review, an eco-journal of art and literature. She's also the author of Red Earth, an eco-feminist collection of poetry. A literature educator by profession, she is passionate about the entanglements in art, literature, nature, and the environment. Next, we have Noor. Noor is a Singaporean artist whose practice is rooted in self-portraiture. Their work span the disciplines of photography, film, video, performance, text, and spoken word poetry that engage with ideas of belonging and identity through frameworks of gender performance, ethnographic portraits, and transnational histories. And next we have Dr. Serena Rahman. She's a visiting fellow at the ISEAS Yusuf Ishak Institute, where she examines issues of unsustainable development, rural politics, and political ecology. She is the co-founder of Kalab Alami, which is a community organization that has worked since 2008 to enable a fishing community in Southwest Johor to participate in and benefit from unavoidable surrounding development and urbanization. And lastly, we have our moderator, who is also the co-editor of Making Kin, um, Angelia Poon. So Angelia teaches literature at the National Institute of Education at NTU, and her research interests include postcolonial theory and contemporary Anglophone literature, with a focus on issues pertaining to globalization, um, gender, class, and racial subjectivities. So now I will pass the time over to Angelia to start the session for us. Thanks very much, Erin, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I'll start by reading out our land acknowledgement. Um, I'll start and then uh, Esther will take over. The editors of Making Kin would like to acknowledge the land we rest and reside on, the land that inspires our work and pervades our dreams. Many of us are descendants of immigrants who left their ancestral homes from across the seas to make this land their home. We give thanks to this land for caring for our ancestors, which has allowed us to now call this land our home. We acknowledge that this land was built by violence towards the environment and traditional and indigenous communities from within and beyond our shores. Land reclamation has expanded Singapore's land mass, but this has come at a heavy price to our neighbors. For instance, the loss of traditional mangrove communities in Cambodia and entire islands disappearing in Indonesia. To further our economic prowess, indigenous communities, the descendants of the Orang Laut, were forcibly removed from their island homes between the 1960s to the 1990s, which are now big oil refineries, a massive landfill for the mainland's waste disposal, entertainment hubs, military bases, expensive residences for expatriate communities. We give thanks to the land for sustaining us in the face of deforestation and urban redevelopment, which began in colonial times and persist today. We recognize that we inhabit this land along with our more than human kin. The fish, 
corals and marine life in the sea, the birds of the air, the insects, animals, trees and plants that inhabit the earth and the beings beneath. We give thanks too to the lands of our imaginations and travels, to expanded notions of home and belonging, and to kinships and entanglements with places that continue to nurture us from afar. Here, we raise our hands and give thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we will begin maybe with an introduction to um, what is ecofeminism. So let me just share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I think just for the benefit of everyone attending this session um, and to also um, maybe define or explain or qualify how ecofeminism is um, presented in Making Kin, I just have a couple of slides. Um, so I think ecofeminism, um, many of us, some of us might understand this um, as how it centers the woman in a web of relations to the earth. And ecofeminism is mainly primarily interested in um, woman nature relationships and how these entanglements are typically negatively impacted by patriarchy. Um, ecofeminism also emphasizes the importance of reciprocity and care, as well as cooperation and love for our earth and our kin, which may be human and more than human. And um, it resists the path of dominance and domination of earth of others, as well as violence. Um, instead, it is open to mutual connections and interdependence. There is also a deep recognition of our shared existence as earthlings, meaning as inhabitants of the earth. And that if we want to first care, um, be cared for by our earth, we need to first care for our earth. I think um, you will also notice that in the essays in Making Kin, there is this recognition that our existence is only made possible through the thriving of others. And so fundamentally, um, we could say that ecofeminism contradicts a patriarchal capitalist way of thinking in terms of individualism, competition, profits and progress. So lastly, um, I think the essays in Making Kin present practices of kin making, of kinship and care, and relational ways of being on earth. So if you have the book and you have read the introduction, you will notice that this is also what we mentioned about how um, ecofeminism is founded upon um, a politics of relations. And I think the essays, the contributors in these essays um, do that as well in, you know, in their various ways and in their various um, uh, living, out, living out their experience of being a woman on earth. And we also want to say that it is not necessary to be a woman or to be female or to identify as a one to embody an, uh, an eco-feminist ethos of care. We also recognize that some of our contributors do not explicitly identify as eco-feminist, and that's fine as well. Um, our notion of womanhood as well is quite um, broad and uh, inclusive. And, you'll, and so you'll see that you know, we have Nora here with us today as well and uh, she'll be talking about her work as well. Um, lastly, I think this concept of kin making as person making is taken from Donna Haraway's um, book, Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin Staying with the Trouble. And um, in terms of how we can make kin um, with places and with earth others beyond the notion of ancestry and genealogy, which is, I think, um, a more, I guess, a more conventional way of defining kin. And so we want to look beyond that. Yeah, so that's my um, introduction to what, what defines, you know, what is ecofeminism and how this is um, engaged with in making kin. And uh, Angelia will continue to share about the personal essay. So I'll just stop sharing now. Thank you, um, Esther. Yeah, I just want to say a few words about why Esther and I decided on uh, the form of the personal essay. We felt very strongly that the personal essay form was especially suitable for eco-feminist uh, reflections, uh, as it is uh, an accessible form, while being also expansive and flexible enough to accommodate a wide variety of views and ideas. 
um, for us, the personal essay form hinges on the uniqueness of the personal voice that is conveyed in writing. So that voice may be uh, may convey intellectual abstractions, or it may zoom in on the minute and the mundane when teasing out a memory. Personal truths are teased out from the thoughts and experiences of the writer who takes, us on, who takes on the role of narrator and embarks on a journey through her memory. So as a form, the personal essay is liberating and also potentially subversive, with a tendency to surprise. Most importantly, the personal essay creates a profound sense of intimacy between writer and reader. And that's what we hope you as reader will experience in this book of 18 essays. Making Kin demonstrates our desire to revive the personal essay form in the consciousness of Singapore literature, because it is still a relatively undeveloped form in Anglophone writing here. Um, okay, that's all uh, I have to say about the personal essay form. So I think we can move on to uh, start our panel uh, discussion. Um, and uh, perhaps here at this point, um, to start our discussion, I could invite um, Esther to read from her essay, which is entitled The Field. Esther? Yeah, thanks, thanks Angelia, for that. And I realized that um, our our backgrounds, I don't know if you see this, but it's, it's mirroring each other. It's really quite uh, poetic. It's really quite nice. Okay, so I'll be reading from The Field, um, which is um, uh, an essay that reflects on this field um, of my childhood, which is no longer around because it got redeveloped. Um, yeah, so this is just an excerpt. Mary Oliver writes in Upstream that a writer's subject may just as well be what she longs for and dreams about in an unquenchable dream, in lush detail and harsh honesty. And yet, to long for the subject of this essay, the field of my childhood, childhood, is to long for a broken and irretrievable past. A place or habitation I can no longer enter in the physical sense, though I keep returning to it in my dreams, in various iterations and permutations, the field changing each time, but still the same. The field of my dreams was once a field of green, inhabited by wildflowers I would only later learn the names of. One day, upon visiting my mother, she hands me two books I used to own as a child, a guide to the wildflowers of Singapore and a guide to medicinal plants, scientific handbooks published by the Singapore Science Centre. I flipped the cover and on the reverse side, my mother's name, Mrs. Vincent Elaine, is written in blue ink, dated 10th of March, 1999, against paper ringed with the sepia of mold. These would be the same two handbooks I would consult 21 years later, as I revise a poem for a creative writing graduate course about childhood, memory, and change. But what's of the field, you ask? To paint a landscape from memory, one has to take certain liberties. But let me endeavor to, rec to recreate the scene as accurately as I can remember, as accurately as it is deserving of memory. To a child, the field was an immeasurable expanse of grassland, a gentle slope leading up to a plateau where all around is an ocean of green. Of course, there were already high-rise blocks bordering the edges of the field, but a child's mind is immune to limits and boundaries. And so I invented stories and places, telling myself that to my north, was a strange and forbidden land. In reality, my mother had disallowed me from venturing too far, the field containing my adventures and exploits. To my east, the road of daily traffic. To my south, my castle, my home. And to my west, nothing of real consequence. The adventure begins with waving goodbye to my mother, walking out the house gates in slippers, my fingers trailing the white walls of the corridor 
fingering the peeled beige paint of the metal staircase. Sometimes, if I was lucky, I would be greeted by a tiger moth resting on the wall. But if not, I would skip down the three floors of stairs, walk past the lift landing on the ground floor, towards the pillars at the void deck, phone booth to the left, letter boxes somewhere nearby. Past all that, the block would end with a narrow strip of metal dreams. And all I had to do was take a breath and cross over, and I would enter another world. The field was always there for me, waiting. And I was always eager to be alone in her company. I remember climbing up the little slope with great effort, imagining it was a steep incline, and then running across the wide expanse, lungs bursting like the white tufts of the common Vernonia fruits when they explode from the tight cups of their flowering, or blowing bubbles into the air when I brought along with me a small bottle of cheap soap. I remember touching and sniffing the wildflowers knowing they were common weeds, but loving them all the same. How I would look for grass blues, little silver blue but butterflies that were ever in abundance, flitting from wildflower to wildflower, doing their work diligently, interrupted only by my thumb and forefinger when I picked them up in wonder before setting them free on their powdery voyage. The grass was green, and the field of my childhood was open to me, like a mother whose heart would daily welcome the daughter who stood at the door asking to return home. Yeah. So that was the field. Thanks very much, Esther. That was really lovely. Um, it's really interesting, I think, uh, to see how uh, an empty field can hold so many imaginative possibilities. Do you think you could share with us some of your ideas about the relationship between um, memory and ecofeminism? Yeah, thanks for the question, um, Angelia. Yeah, so this, um, of course, this personal essay is very um, close to my heart. I think as all the topics are to all the contributors, and you'll see that later when Serena and Nor read the essays. Um, yeah, so I, I think that there is no clear um, link between ecofeminism and memory, meaning that I feel that memory itself is not ecofeminist. But what I think is that um, what is being remembered in terms of the memory and how memory is presented, I think that can be ecofeminist in nature, you know, if we return to the definition of what is ecofeminism that I shared uh, earlier on. So I think. Um, first of all, we also need to distinguish the difference between memory and history, you know, what is recounted from the past and um, who presents this history to us as opposed to um, personal memory. And then there's also cultural memory, right? So cultural memory um, actually refers to interconnections between memory, culture and identity. And also it's very interested in the relationship between um, the past and the present. Um, I think as well as how individuals, how groups, how societies um, remember, rework, bury, or forget. So there's also this uh, forgetting, right? Uh, aspects of the past in order to make sense of uh, repair and reconstruct the present. So I'm reading this definition from um, the University of Brighton. So I think in terms of cultural memory, um, I would say that there is this need to create collective and shared memories to remember um, our kinships, our entanglements, our mutual thriving, you know, with uh, others. And I think that's what Making Kin um, attempts to do as well, you know, in the essays, it is a way of recollecting and, and reviving certain uh, silence, forgotten histories and stories and narratives. And um, I would say that in terms of representation of memory, if we think about an ecocentric notion of memory and remembering, um, for instance, if we ask ourselves, you know, um, how does the world, how does the natural world remember, right? Um, we usually think about um, the human, the anthropocentric or the human notion of memory, but what about the natural world, for instance, migratory birds, right? How do they remember um, the routes that they take? And, you know, it is also quite sad because they remember um, the migratory path, but the thing is when they return to these places, what happens to these places when these places change, right, with urbanization? Um, I also have this um, slide just to share um, about the bee orchid. So some of you might be familiar with this. Let me just see if I can um, pull it out in terms of uh, 
just I, I think to illustrate my point on memory. So the bee orchid is um, can be found in the UK, and I think in a uh, part of Ireland it's also um, conserve a species of uh, plant, and this is what it looks like. And I, I thought I would share this comic strip, which I, I feel is a good example of um, an eco-feminist um, you know, way of remembering something. So XKCD writes, uh, so in the first panel, there are these orchids whose flowers look like female bees. When males try to mate with them, they transfer pollen. Right in the second panel, this orchid, um, Ophirus epifera, makes flowers, but no bees land on them because the bee it mimics went extinct long ago. Right? Without its partner, the orchid has resorted to self-pollinating, a last-ditch genetic strategy that only delays the inevitable. Right? Nothing of the bee remains, but we know it existed from the shape of the flower. It's an idea of what the female bee looked like to the male bee as interpreted by a plant. Okay, wow. So, and then in the next, um, in the next, uh, so the only memory of the bee is a painting by a dying flower, right? And this is, you notice that, of course, this is the only panel that is painted in color by the artist, by the comic artist. Okay, and then the characters move on. You look at the four panels below, but the, the boy returns, right? I'll remember you, bee orchid, right? I'll remember you, and then walks away. So I thought this was really quite poignant and I wanted to share this with everyone. Um, let me see if I can uh, okay, stop, stop sharing first. Yeah, so yeah, so I just wanted to share this with everyone um, because I thought that it's uh, quite, quite a good example of how um, an eco-feminist way of remembering, you know, um, might be envisioned. So of course in the essays we see that, but also in other art forms like comics, you know, this is also one example, um, one way in which stories, myths, rituals, or even like histories, narratives might remind us of our kinship to others, right? Like how the bee um, is kin to the flower and now without the bee, um, the flower still remembers, you know? So that's one example of nature's way of remembering and it's, it's quite sad, um, but yeah, that that's... Uh, that's what it is, right? That's, yeah, that's, so, that's very yeah. great. That's great, Esther. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really like the comic that you uh, shared and yeah. um, the, that, the reminder, really, that I guess nature also uh, remembers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that your um, explanation of memory in terms of personal as well as cultural and natural uh, is, a, is a very good one to think about, especially since we tend to forget maybe the, the way that nature might remember. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if... Um, Maybe um, Noor or Serena has have anything to say about memory and how that uh, impacts their the work that they do. Would anyone want to go first? Uh, I could I could share sure. a little bit. Uh, Esther, when you were sharing about your essay, the field, I remember. I I think uh, most of us would have similar experiences as well. Um, I guess when you're surrounded by the concrete jungle. Uh, my sisters and I used to roll down the hills of Bukit Ho Swee when we were really young and it was um, yeah, it was so much freedom and, and the tiger morph, uh, that's, that's also a, a very significant memory of mine from childhood and we would, uh, I think the tiger morph would mate and yes. for some reason because they become heavier when they fly so uh, it would be easier for them to land in our hands, that was a huge part of our memory, yeah. yeah. That's I great, thanks. That yeah. Now, my memories are all of the sea. Um, so, I mean, I, I see lovely things on land, but um, because I, I traveled as a child, so um, I was lucky and I got to swim in the Red Sea at a very young age before all the development around it. And my dad tossed me in the ocean when I was six months old. Um, and I was really lucky to be swimming off of Hong Kong when I was three and four, three or four. But I, it was in Jeddah that I started snorkeling in the Red Sea. And so you can imagine it was really beautiful then. There was no development. I don't, I don't think it's like that anymore. And I would snorkel with my dad on the reef flat and then get to the edge. Um, I was only seven and he would dive down and I would stand on the edge and watch. Um, and you, all you see is color and it's so clear. And all you see is this color and that, that stays with me forever. So now whenever I dive, I'm in the water. That is kind of like my benchmark. 
um, to see that kind of color and life and clear water. Um, and that just keeps flooding back all the time. That's great. Thanks, Serena. Yeah, I, I, I know that the sea really comes across very strongly in your essay. That, that was lovely to, uh, to read about that. Um, Esther, maybe you, I, 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 I realize I may have just cut you off, sorry. If you had wanted to say more about uh, memory or, or what memory is like. Oh, no, no, yeah, it, it's okay. I think it was good to, to bring in Nora and Serena because I, I mean, I think we were also having this conversation the other day um, at, at the launch of my other book, Red Earth, and how um, Gina was saying that, um, you know, we think that we have personal memories and personal kind of like our rememberings, right? But the, our, our experience is actually not unique. And it's kind of like a collective and shared, um, you know, consciousness, shared memory, shared traumas, shared joys as well. So it's very nice to hear, you know, that let's say Nora also had similar memories um, mm -hmm. of uh, relating to nature and to a feel. And I think Serena as well, um, even, even though you mentioned that you're very close to the sea, I think that's also the idea is the earth, right? I mean, the earth is made of land and sea and we just find our own ways of relating to uh, various parts of the world, yeah, based on where we are, right? Um, yeah. But I, yeah, I think to, to just uh, add to Angela's point, um, I, I think I'll just add two more points. So um, I was also thinking about, because lately I've been reading Ursula Le Guin's uh, Carrier Back Theory of Fiction. So she draws from Elizabeth uh, Fisher's Carrier Back Theory of Human Evolution. And what Elizabeth Fisher says is that the first cultural device was probably a recipient. So it's quite different from, let's say, um, the very like patriarchal phallic way of um, thinking about human evolution as like a spear or like an implement of violence. Um, and so she, the queen posit, uh, posits that, you know, the story could be read as a carrier bag or a container. And so then I was thinking of memory, you know, memory as a carrier bag itself. So memory as a thing that holds something else. And um, if we think about how carrier bags or containers or holders are made, you know, it's made by knotting or stitching or weaving or braiding. Um, yeah, and so to, to hold these shared communal kind of collective histories, collective stories, which are both personal and yet, you know, um, shared, shared as well. So I think the personal essay really um, does a great job of uh, being like a carrier bag for memory. And I think the second point that I wanted to just mention and share with everyone is also how um, we could think as um, think of memory as a voyage of returning. So Le Guin also writes in her book, The, the Dispossessed, that to be whole is to be part. The true voyage is return. So true voyage is return, right? So the idea of, um, I think, um, like an eco-feminist lens, you know, some people may say that, oh, you know, it seems like it's a return to like older ways of thinking, mm -hmm. uh, older ways of being. Uh, yeah, so the truth is that true voyage is return, right? We always think that um, to progress, right? The idea of progress is also a, like a very capitalist, a modern kind of a thought, like to move forward. But actually, I think the, I think the beauty is in returning, you know, returning home, returning back to stories that may have been silenced, you know, untold, to dispossess stories, dispossess memories um, from which new insights may be gained. So I think this is a way in which memory can be, um, I, uh, I guess, engaged through an eco-feminist lens. So I hope that uh, that offers some, some insight. Yeah. Yes, that's great, Esther. Yeah, I, I'm very struck by this idea of uh, the carrier bag and how perhaps that predates the spear and all. And I think it also links to uh, the whole idea that we want to uh, convey with making kin, that perhaps the, uh, and it's a more hopeful idea, I suppose, as well, that perhaps the first you know thing that uh, human beings constructed was a container in order to share with others and that's a form of making kin rather than you know a, a weapon to with which to kill your uh, kin right so I, I thought that's a really nice uh, way to think about it um, perhaps now I could ask uh, Nuo to share her uh, essay Semanga in practice okay hi thank you Angelia so uh, I'll start uh, my sharing with uh, the poem that is part of the essay, An Ocean. When the last man leaves Earth, the inhabitants of Atlantis will rise again, this time claiming permanent independence and with a booming voice, an announcement. Manusia terlalu taksu pada asteroid, pada debu bintang, sehingga leka. 95% lautan masih belum diselami dan belum dijejaki kerana mereka takut kelemasan. 
I wrote this poem in 2014 while I was serving in the Coast Guard. I had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to patrol the southern waters of Singapore and often caught glimpses of the southern islands, Pulau Sudong, Pulau Pawai, and Pulau Senang. While I originally wrote an ocean as a love poem to a boy who would not love me back, I have to say it was the semangat of Singapore's southern waters that breathed life into this poem. There was something heartbreaking about how the island my paternal grandmother hailed from was now a military, tra military, training, military, military training ground. This poem was a way of remembering my people and the ocean. While my paternal grandmother is a Singaporean islander, my Indonesian mother came from one of the islands in Riau. According to my grandmother, prior to strict immigration and border control, she used to travel to my mom's island by sampan. When I was 10 years old, my Indonesian mother was stopped at the immigration checkpoint of Harbourfront Ferry, Ferry Terminal. This was something that happened frequently whenever my family waited for incoming guests from my mother's hometown. The immigration officers were close to sending my mother home until they saw my grandmother and me frantically waving to her outside at the arrival hall. The reunion was poignant. My mother cried as it was the first time in many years that she had entered Singapore to be with me again. Every year during our national day, Singapore parrots the narrative of our transformation from a fishing village to a first world country. In my work, Sekali Lagi, I ask, are the fishermen not our people too? Oftentimes, I wonder how differently Singapore and our neighboring nations would be if we moved beyond the interests of our self-imposed borders. What if we looked at the sea as a connector and a living continuous flow of energy and resource instead of seeing ourselves as isolated islands? Ecofeminism asks us to think of our relations to the earth and the environment in all aspects of our lives, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and class. To know oneself is to know one's history. To know one's history is to know one's land. To know one's land is also to know one's sea. To honor the earth and all of its elements as something alive, full of samangat, is to consider it the imbalance we will cause to others and ourselves when we do not honor the very ground that we step on and the seas that surround and nourish us. To think of the seas as a shared connector is also shared connector is also to think beyond the often violently created borders of states and the needs of people outside our country who will be impacted by our wants. When we are able to acknowledge the interconnectedness of our identities, our shared histories beyond the lands we occupy and our interdependence through the seas we share, instead of co competing capitalistically to be a nation with the best resources and living conditions, maybe then we'll be able to connect to the semangat of Mother Earth again. My art practice did not begin with an environmentalist land. However, I eventually realized that it is impossible to separate the self and the body from the land and the sea you come from. The semangat of Ditana Air and Bumi will always find its way to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. No, that was lovely. Uh, I, I, I remember reading uh, your essay for the first time and I was struck by that incident that you just shared about how your mom was stopped at the, at the, at the border. And, uh, you know, just the thought of like how arbitrary uh, borders are mm -hmm. and what would it, you know, what would Singapore be like if, if we just thought about it as uh, in terms of uh, part of an archipelago, right? We tend to forget the other islands. So, so I really like that, that idea that to know one's land is also to know one's sea. And I wonder how you think Singapore society might be able um, to, to do that, you know, to put that into practice and, and the role that maybe art can play. And perhaps you could tell us uh, uh, based on your own art practice. Sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so for me, uh, give me a second. When I think about uh, art at its simplest form, I think of it as expression first. Before any of us can learn to write or even speak, we are able to, if you just give a child a crayon or even any form of pencil or a paintbrush, 
children will be able to express themselves uh, freely. And oftentimes it's, uh, it's the first steps that we take to, to be able to share our stories. Uh, even though as a child, you might not exactly be sure what the story is. Um, and then um, as a child grows up, uh, we, we teach them uh, tools such as guiding lines, coloring within the lines, shading, curves, uh, and other visual tools that can help better tell a story. Um, so when I think about expression and storytelling in Singapore, I think of these two questions. Uh, what type of expression gets celebrated and who gets to tell our stories. Um, and then from these two questions, I, um, we can further expand on them uh, to think about what type of images are available in our galleries, who are making these images, who are winning awards and uh, commissions for these images, and uh, what type of images are we lacking in. I think the stories and images we share are also very much dependent on whether our form of expressions are celebrated or stifled. Um, and I think for the longest time, I felt that my story uh, and my family's story uh, was something to be deeply ashamed of. I don't know uh, where or how that came about, but I think uh, all the way up until uh, my diploma, uh, I just... It, you know, this, this, I felt that these stories were, uh, they were important to me, but the, you don't share, you don't usually share these stories. Um, and um, I think at the end of the day, it also uh, boils down to uh, who deserves to know these stories, right? Um, and I think uh, a big part of why a lot of our stories and our expressions are not um, being shared is because uh, the references that are available or accessible uh, don't exactly uh, encourage um, the stories that you have. So sometimes I couldn't find the right flowery words uh, or the right angle and lighting uh, because just because the references were not uh, right in front of me. Um, so I think that um, usually you can't tell a story if you're told from young that the way you express yourself isn't the most optimum or effective. Um, we can think of it as being scolded for coloring outside the lines or adding on elements to a coloring book that's not there. Uh, and also, are we allowing ourselves space to hold expression that uh, we may not necessarily grasp immediately? Um, uh, and by acknowledging that there is potential for more stories, more truths to uncover, uh, in the languages and vernacular that we are not so used to, yeah. Great, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I really like the, the idea of um expression, especially vernacular expression, and I agree with you that you know sometimes I um not sure where that comes from, but there's a certain embarrassment about the local or feeling that something is not uh, good enough maybe to share with everybody. Um, but, but I think that through your art practice, you have, you have shown uh, us that, that is, is, that's not the right notion to, to have. And I, I wonder if um, uh, Esther and Serena have any thoughts about, about this, uh, what, what they think about uh, expression and the importance of the vernacular, I suppose, and the local in expression. Um, I'm jumping in because yeah. I just want to say that no, I, I, if I was you, I would be so proud. Like I would be so honored to be you. I think I think you're amazing and you have such amazing roots that you know and you can touch and you can feel and see. Um, my work in this village is to tell the local people to be proud that they are descendants of fishermen and and you know I I grew up traveling and I didn't have roots, so I'm constantly searching for roots. I have no home to go back to. But you have your island. Okay, now it's a military base, fine. But you know, you you do have that. And I think Singapore is is desperately trying to find this nostalgia, this these roots, these origins, which are there but buried. And if I was you, I would be so proud of you to be you, you know. So I just I really wanted to say that about, about the vernacular and expression. I think it is a, a symptom of development and materialism that that we find shame in in the simple. And in our origins, and I think I think the nation really needs to evolve that because because if we if we don't have our history, we would not have us. If we do not have the original people, there would be no Singapore. Um, and this needs to be recovered and not buried. Um, 
who needs the colonial masters? We need our origins. And I think it's people like Noor that should speak more and have more arts and have more space and more flat platforms like this to, to bring out the authentic, not to romanticize these, these issues, but to speak of the authentic, um, you know, the difficulties in crossing the borders. The fishermen that I live with, they also used to cross freely between here and Tuas. Um, and of course it, it came to an end, but, but this is you, this is the real you. Um, speak, tell people. I think there is a, a thirst for it now. Um, and I'm so glad I met you on this panel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, here, yeah, yeah. here. <laughs> Uh, Esther, maybe I don't know whether you know as a poet also you you might have uh, thoughts about this. Yeah, I think just to add to what Serena mentioned, uh, her affirmation of Nor. Yeah, I, I I'm actually quite envious, I guess as well. You know, of you Nor, but I think this um maybe like what Angelia said, embarrassment, right? This embarrassment, or maybe even sometimes we might feel shame, you know, about ourselves or our stories. I feel that it's actually like a side effect of colonialism. You know, and um, also this kind of like uh, the canon and, and the imperial, imperialism of uh, what, what is important, which narratives are important, um, and, and then which narratives are not important, right? So, so people in power deciding that, okay, this is the official narrative and this is what we want to hear, this is what we read about in textbooks, right? This is what uh, we see in the media. Um, and so then we internalize that, okay, so then everything else that falls by the wayside, like what I referred to earlier, the dispossessed stories, the silent stories, the untold stories, which were always there, right, um, I think need to resurface. And, and so I, I agree with Serena that there seems to be this um, hunger for reclamation. Uh, maybe this is also uh, ties into this whole like eco crisis, right, and the climate crisis and also um, maybe move, moving past, moving past, um, hopefully we are able, able to move past our colonial history. Not that we um, erase it as well, because it is part of our story, it is part of our history, but I think we also need to return to um, older, older times and older ways you know, of uh, being before col colonialism. So I feel that um, the colonial history actually plays a very big part because it also influenced the kind of stories we read, right? The books that we read as children, and then the kind of narratives that we that we would have um, internalized and also felt were legitimate, you know, the voices that we felt were legitimate. Yeah, so I think that that's what I have to add. Yeah. Great, thanks, Esther. And I just want to make the, the point that uh, uh, you find many, I think, local, really strongly rooted uh, stories in the collection. So I hope the listeners will, you know, uh, really uh, be able to enjoy uh, more of the local through this collection as well. Um, perhaps now I can also ask uh, Serena to uh, read from her essay, and the title of her essay is The Serenia Has Found Her Home. Hi, thanks again for having me on this panel. Um, because I realize everybody else is kind of reading from the front and I'm reading from the end, um, and pretty much giving away the plot. So I have to <laughs> sort of give some context. So as I've said, you know, I travel the world, and but I've been living in this fishing village since 2008, and I'm in a fishing village in the southwest of Malaysia, Peninsula Malaysia, in Johor. Um, and it's a very different world and a very different life from the one I had before. Um, my dad was a diplomat, and we traveled well. I was a very fortunate um, child living this third culture childhood, um, and always, always looking for my roots. So I think my whole life has been a journey to find out where I'm from, um, but my time here has been evolutionary in discovering that, um, that perhaps maybe I, my dreams that I, I thought I was heading towards were not what I wanted. So the excerpt that I will read um, sort of get, brings you to, to the end of this journey, not that it's any here, but where it is now, where I've already gone through the rest of the, the chapter um, earlier that you can read when you buy the book, um, tells you about how I get to this point. Um, but you know, my point is that what I'm about to share is a bit of insight into the people that I've been engaging with for the last, I don't know, 12, almost 15 years. Um, and the people who are now sort of this family that I sometimes want to or don't want to accept. So this is more about making kin. Um, and then, you know, I'll explain thereafter. So let me just pull this up so I can read it. Um, the excerpt is this. 
Not long after his return from KL in 2015, Shalan set up a seafood market to ensure that the fishermen earn a fair price for their catch. Pasar Pendeka Lao at Sea Warriors Market now pays fishermen twice what they used to earn as he takes a fraction of the amount that other middlemen take above the lending price. Shalan also helps them weave their nets, which frequently need to be replaced, as well as finances, boat and engine repairs. The craft of tying nets is preserved through this effort as he has forced all the younger fishermen to learn the skills and work with him to support older, slower fishermen with their nets. This is all documented by the Club Alami youth and myself. The boys have been integral in this effort, initially heading out to see themselves to learn the trade, then working with the fishermen to develop standard operating procedures for our sustainable fisheries and endangered species reporting systems. The fishermen now release and report critically endangered species, such as eagle and shovel nose rays, and are roped into our research by providing expert knowledge on endangered species locations and habits. Shalan ensures that the seafood caught is a minimum size and quality. Those that don't make the grade are released and unpaid for. The youth have also set up a food store nearby to ensure that the fishermen have freshly cooked food to eat when they return from sea, and market customers are enticed by the scent of traditionally cooked fresh seafood. They often end up buying more raw catch to have it cooked on the spot for them to eat or bring home. At the same time, customers are taught about seafood seasonality, are enlightened on the hazards of artisanal fishing and the skills required to bring in the seafood for their tables. They are also made to understand that the fishermen must be fairly compensated for their effort, craft and knowledge so that they are better able to provide for their families. This then is how I earn my daily perch at the jetty as cashier and logbook keeper. The arrival of COVID-19 has closed the Singapore-Malaysia border and I can no longer go into work every day. While I am able to work from home, I use my mornings to soak in the sea breeze and fishermen's stories when they return with their catch. I document the reports of the wind, water and weather and photograph the fishery species or bycatch as they come in. I feel like a bit of a fixture at the jetty now, no longer deemed as improper or inappropriate as before. The fishermen by nature are a relaxed lot. They have seen me haul petrol tanks, engines, baskets full of fish and crabs and are used to my incessant questions offering all manner of information on species identification and behavior. They know that I'm not just by the water, but also in the water every chance I get. They have taken us out on research trips and have watched with some worry when I dive into the murky shallows around the seagrass meadows and island. The first time I headed out to dive, Shalan's grandfather who lives at the jetty asked me in surprise, girls dive too now? Now they just ask what I found. The fishermen marvel at my excitement at seeing creatures that they always see but never knew were special and seem to have taken on more responsibility in cajoling others to fish more sustainably. They're also active look, actively looking out for bycatch species that we may not have seen before and reporting on every change in the weather, water and winds. My nagging has made them a little more careful about the rubbish they all, almost automatically toss into the water. There are very few other women about. Only a handful accompany their spouses to sea to do actual work. I've only known two who head out on their own, both referred to as tomboys by the community. While I'm always happy to see both and engage in light chit chat, there is nothing as intrusive as the interrogation of the interrogations that I used to endure in my early days in the village. I see the women who accompany their husbands as they pass by our jetty and they wave and smile in quiet acknowledgement of another female who knows the seas as they do. Many women in the village don't. Um, and that's my excerpt. Um, so, it's kind thanks. of odd, but when you buy the book, you, then you kind of get the rest of the picture if you read the beginning. Thanks. Thanks so much, Serena. I really like um, uh, what, what you just read. And I think it encapsulates, I think your essay uh, really encapsulates what uh, the whole idea of making kin uh, is about. Uh, the way you have um, kind of uh, uh, reached some kind of equilibrium with the, uh, uh, the village that, that uh, you, you're in. Um, so maybe I could ask you to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, how much you know you've you've invested obviously a lot of time and effort uh, in making kin at the village, and what would you say are some of the hardest challenges that you had to overcome uh, in making kin? Um, for me, um, so the story is I came here to teach the kids about the habitat. And then I worked with this one guy who was our boatman in the beginning. And then after a number of years, uh, we ended up getting married. So then the biggest struggle for me 
um, was understanding and accepting that I essentially married the entire sub-district because I'm a very like on my own kind of person and I really don't want to engage with people so much. Um, so then I ended up marrying the entire district and like my life and my business and my property was suddenly everybody's knowledge and business and property. So that was quite a struggle for me. I'm sorry, but there's a lorry going by and in the Um And so, and so this was one of my biggest issues. I suddenly in inherited an entire sub-district. Getting used to how the community functions is also very difficult because you know, from being alone and not having to deal with people, everybody's pretty much in your face and you have to accept them and you can't ignore them because then you're arrogant. So you just kind of need to be nice to everybody whether you like them or not. The other bigger issue was, um, okay, we'll just let the lorry get past because it's right in front of me. I'm sitting by the road at the minute because that's the only place I can get the Wi-Fi. Um, the other issue was really understanding local women. And this is one of the reasons why I struggle with the term feminism, uh, because when I first moved here in 2007, 2008, I was fodder for gossip, right? Because nobody knew who I was or what I was doing. I was just this rich kid from KL um, who was coming here and in their minds, you know, here to, to steal their husbands and boyfriends and, um, you know, I'm sorry. Itu belakang buah sampah ni tempat ini. Jangan saya tengah bincang maaf. Tak boleh ambil. Tak tak boleh tak boleh saya tengah bincang maaf. I'm sorry. This is what happens when you're in a village. Um, somebody just came by and wants to take all the metal rubbish at the back of the house. Okay, so let me go back to what I was saying. I'm really sorry. It had to happen exactly when I was speaking. Um, so no worries. <laughs> I think this. you've given our audience a, a very a good indication of, you know, where, where you are, your context. Oh my god! Yeah, so it's, okay, so this is the local random people who don't understand that when you're talking to a computer, um, you know, you're actually engaging with other people beyond the village. But other than that, uh, local women's approaches to life is what I was saying. I was, you know, gossip fodder, but also I think their, their goals for their daughters um, are very different. And this then influences how the daughters think for themselves. Um, and so it really is a change in um, mindset that I, I struggle with because, uh, you know, for some of these, these girls that I, I worked with, we had many who were part of Club Malami, um, they sort of bought into my story of you can do more, you can go out, you can engage with people, but their mothers, their aunts, their boyfriends were telling them no this is not for you, you need to stay at home. I have had mothers screaming at me at weddings and at the Shell gas station to say, my daughter's place is in the kitchen. She's supposed to be here to serve her brothers and, and us. Um, you know, she shouldn't be with you working in the environment. You know, um, I've had mothers tell me, no, there's no need to teach your, uh, my daughter's English. They're just gonna get married and work in the factory in front of the house and stay home. Those same mothers came to me and asked me to teach their sons English. I said, no. Um, so these are things that I, I struggle with. And for this reason, I completely ignore. OK, no, I can't say that. I avoid local women um, as much as possible just for my own sanity, but also because there are too many questions. There's, there's too many um, conflicts in the way we think, um, you know, and it's, that's difficult. So those are the, are the main things that I struggle with. Thanks, thanks, Serena. I I appreciate the difficulties then, you know, I guess having to navigate, negotiate with different ways of thinking um, and um, probably the way that they, uh, you know, that the village might still see you as an outsider or someone cosmopolitan coming in here. So so I, I, I think that your essay really captures all the uh, those challenges and difficulties very well. Um, wonder if uh, Noor and Esther uh, have, have anything to say in response to the difficulties of making kin or, or perhaps the pleasures of making kin if, if, if um, you have something to share. Uh, no, uh, go first? Okay, uh, okay sure. sure. No, I mean, uh, I think for me, um, well, making kin uh, through my art was always been, has always been uh, something joyous, where um, especially, I guess, when I am able to meet other uh, transgender or uh, 
queer, non-binary people, uh, and seeing how they approach um, their visual storytelling because some, sometimes it's not exactly the safest uh, to take up space when uh, so much of your existence is, uh, I guess you can say it's very political when it's not. Um, and I think I, uh, while I, uh, I in, in some ways I, I relate to Serena where, you know, uh, the idea of inheriting something that you didn't ask for, I think it's something that uh, I, per perhaps we all uh, experience in one way or another. And I think um, coming to terms with who you are, your beliefs, your values, uh, and uh, how it may not make sense in uh, your immediate locality or the people around you um, making kin uh, through, through strangers uh, is something that can be so, um, the word is not liberating, but it can be, it, it can provide a lot of comfort to see how other people uh, navigate uh, such uh, circumstances. And I must say that uh, I've been very lucky um, because Singapore is really small. So it's, it's uh, when you do meet somebody, uh, if you don't meet somebody, somebody will point to you, uh, a person who is like that, yeah. Thanks, thanks for that, No. Um, and I just wanted to uh, uh, plug Noor's essay. So readers out there, if you read Noor's essay, you, you will learn more about her art practice uh, and how she really uses art to recover memory. I mean, to me, that's, that's really important. Um, and also to express herself. And um, there are a lot of uh, pictures uh, in her essay uh, as well. So that's really worth uh, checking out. Um, Esther, uh, do you have anything to, to share as well? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just uh, make a point very quickly because I'm also quite mindful of the time. Um, I, think, I think from what Serena and Noor have shared, it's also quite clear that kin making is not really, um, I, I would say it's a, it's a difficult process and it can be quite um, challenging and it can frustrate us sometimes as well, you know, because uh, we are also different people from such different contexts, right? Such different um, cultural contexts. And, uh, you know, with all, all the different intersectional parts of our identities, when we meet someone else with their own sets of, you know, their own context as well, there's bound to be um, conflict, there's bound to be clashes. And so I think kin making is an ongoing process, you know. Um, I think for me personally, I find that I'm more intrigued with making kin um, with uh, uh, natural elements, you know, with nature. I think similar to Serena, I, I have this desire and search for my roots as well because of my mixed ancestry and uh, ethnicity. But I, I think the idea of uh, kin making when I look at nature is also to transcend that, you know, to transcend the idea of ancestry and genealogy. So much about myself, I don't know. Uh, my, my paternal grandmother was uh, an orphan. She was left at the door of the CHIJ orphanage. And so there's, there's, there's so many questions. And even my paternal um, grandfather, you know, all I know about him is his name and that he left uh, Sri Lanka um, to come here to begin a new life. So I think all these questions, all these not knowings um, has, has led me to look for who I am in a different way, to look at myself as a daughter of the earth and to try and connect with my roots in a more spiritual sense with nature. So yeah, that, that's what I wanted to say about kin making. Thanks, thanks very much, Esther. Yeah, um, just also to say, uh, because uh, uh, when, we, when we talk about making kin, you'll find uh, many of the essays uh, are not only about human relationships, but of course also making kin with uh, species, another uh, species, with animals, with nature. Um, so I hope that, that um, some of these essays will resonate uh, with our readers. Right. I, I think that all the uh, we've, we've touched on quite a number of the important ideas that this collection uh, raises uh, from having Noor and, and Serena read uh, and also Esther. You'll see that um, memory, uh, both collective uh, as well as personal as nat and natural memory, play a big role in uh, some of the essays that we have. Um, Noor talks about her artistic uh, practice and uh, we have quite a number of artists also featured in this uh, collection um, and I think uh, uh, Serena's uh, work, uh, how she has uh, uh, sought to make kin and you know also valiantly uh, struggles uh, over there, I, I think that uh, a, a number of other essays also talk about uh, 
their difficulties, but also uh, in making kin or finding a community uh, of acceptance um, uh, and, and what they had to go through. So I, I, I think that we have, um, you know, covered quite a lot of the important essays that uh, I hope you will find uh, in our collection. Um, and so maybe I, I was going to uh, if, if anyone has any last words uh, that you would like to say, if not, I thought I would um, take a look at uh, any, some of the questions that we, uh, our audience may have posed for us. Um, would anyone like to say anything before we move on to that? I think I'm the holder of the questions, and so it's, it's on my phone. Um, so I haven't really checked. Yeah. So shall we do that? Go okay. Ahead. Okay, let me see. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe I'll post this question first and then there's a question, um, Esther, that, uh, that's for us as uh, editors. But uh, how do you think an eco-feminist practice of care might help us deal with the climate crisis? Um, it's a huge question, I know, um, but also a very timely one given COP26 and what we read every day in the papers uh, and in, on uh, uh, in the media about uh, climate change. Um, so anyone has any thoughts about that? So again, it's how do you think an eco-feminist practice of care might help us deal with the climate crisis. Do Nora and Serena want to yeah. say anything? If not, I will try. I'll go sure, ahead. go ahead, Esther. Yeah. yeah. So I, I agree with Angelia. It's really quite a broad question, right? It, um, it's difficult to answer, I think, in, in one sitting. Um, eco-feminist practice of care. I, I think that many of the, I, I, okay, I think that in, in general, um, a lot of this has to come from policymakers as well, um, because in terms of like collective, our collective impact on the environment, um, it's very clear that um, people with the greatest power, you know, like organizations, corporations, um, governments, um, they do need to really, um, relook whatever it is that needs to be relooked and then you know take action there um i think that we also need to think beyond human notions of um inhabiting the earth if we think about an eco-feminist pra uh, pra practice of care um, we need to look at our earth you know and look at the earth in a more ecocentric kind of way um and that may pose quite uncomfortable questions you know and uncomfortable topics of discussion for instance our human population, right? Um, it is very clear that human um, population on Earth, especially people who come from um, so-called developed nations, you know, in terms of our consumption, in terms of our um, habits, we, we do leave a very heavy uh, carbon footprint on the environment. So then the question is, if we want to make kin and care for our Earth, um, we, we may need to make certain decisions like um, choosing not to have children, for example. So that's why these are very controversial. These may be very controversial topics, um, but I think they are still important to engage with. Even things like food, you know, the food that we eat, um, that's the basis of uh, sustaining ourselves. But then again, um, if we really think about an ecocentric way of, uh, you know, practicing care, then we would also care for the food that we consume, right? And uh, how, how, they are, how the animals are treated, um, before they enter and, you know, to sustain us before they are slaughtered to sustain us. So I think it's really quite difficult to, to respond to this question, but uh, these are just some ways in which we might start to think about it, you know, beyond um, just uh, anth anthropocentric uh, ways of looking at the climate crisis, but to look at our kinships and entanglements with um, various others that, that, you know, need to thrive in order for us to thrive, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Esther. Yeah, I think uh, partly this question is really um, showing us how um, uh, the personal is uh, political and, and the other way around also, really, and uh, what we do in our own um, uh, with our own personal decisions and how that might affect uh, the climate uh, and, and the earth. And when you talk about food, I also just wanted to point out that one of our essays, uh, uh, one of our essays uh, advocates becoming a vegetarian as, you know, doing your part uh, uh, for the earth. And, and that's one, one uh, thing that you people might like to think about. Um, but um, do you, 
do, uh, Serena or No, have anything you would like to add about this idea of the eco-feminist practice of care and how it might help the climate crisis? Perhaps an eco-feminist uh, practice of care where we, you know, put the women in the centre and also think of how we uh, can help do our, our part, whether in local communities and, and smaller groups uh, to help with the climate crisis. Uh, Serena, you, yeah. you want to contribute some? Yeah. I couldn't speak earlier because I couldn't speak earlier because the invasive lorry was making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this this um, this idea of care um, and putting the female at the center, um, I think I think it would differ depending on where you are in the world. So in in Malaysia, for example, the woman really is at the center of everything. The mother is everything and everybody follows what she says and she's treated like a god. I struggle with that. Um, but I think in a, in a society like Singapore's, for example, perhaps ironically, the woman is, is pushed aside a little bit more. Um, and you know, the, the goal of achieving sort of puts the mother's role, um, you know, all the multiple layers of work that, that a woman usually bears is sort of cast aside and hidden by the women themselves. I think the parallel between both worlds that I, that I straddle is that um, it is often women making life more difficult for other women, whether, whether it is the mother's uh, restrictions on their daughters or women's social pressure to achieve you know, from other women. Coming back to climate change, however, I think um, this idea of care and, and putting the women at the center really needs to reverse itself into thinking about ourselves and our impact on the world um, and, and taking that step to act because of the impact that our actions will have on others. So it is the empathy um, towards other beings, not just whether humans, but also towards animals or plants. And I think I, I understand that the, the idea of a female is, is care, but I am not so wholeheartedly believing that all women are so pure and so caring because I've met some very evil women. Um, so I think this is, this is a human issue, not necessarily a gender-based issue, because then what about all the other genders that we have, where do they fall? Um, I think humans as a whole need to think beyond themselves. And I think in Singapore, there is a, no offense, there is a great desire to achieve for yourself, whether it's to compete with others or to achieve certain goals or yeah, it's not my problem, you know, the government will deal with it and tell us what to do. I think we all need to take that step by ourselves, for ourselves and for others. And, you know, to be better people, just, just to be better people, not because the church or the mosque tells you so, but because you know, as a human, this is your duty to the world um, and to the globe and to this earth, which is 70% water, uh, so to the seas, um, you know, and, and to give back because you're here using up everybody's resources, you need to give back to the planet. And that's just your duty as a being, whether you are male, female, others, or whatever race or ethnicity you are. Yeah, my two cents. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Serena, for reminding us of, the, you know, I guess the commonality that we have, which is as humans uh, and the duty and responsibility that uh, we have. And I, I think that's what uh, all of us are, are committed to as well. Uh, no, do you have anything uh, to, to add? I think adding on to Serena's point, uh, I guess the notion of care, right? Um, simply to just, um, uh, I mean, I think to, to, to take care of the earth is also to take care of um, another person so, and also taking care of yourself. Uh, and um, I guess uh, one of the things that I realized through my work is that uh, maybe specifically in the context of Singapore, a lot of people are not able to care about whatever is going on beyond themselves um, or even what we, we don't even have time to care about what we're eating for lunch because we're just so exhausted and we're tired. And um, I think nobody uh, do, I mean, it's reductive, but um, nobody cares. <laughs> I think in, 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 in this capitalistic way of uh, living, uh, how are you 
sometimes I ask my friends, don't you care about what's going on? Like, why is nobody checking in on other people when, say, for example, a certain, uh, certain uh, case of uh, racism is happening, for example, right? But nobody is checking in to ask, like, how somebody else is feeling. Uh, and I've asked people before, um, why do you feel like you are not part of this? And uh, uh, what really sort of, I guess, uh, helped me empathize better was uh, my friend told me, oh, that's because I'm tired. I, 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 I've been working the whole week and I'm not even able to, to think about what I'm having for lunch, how, how I can't have space. So people who can't give won't give. So um, when we think about care, how are we allowing space for that, I think? And um, if we can afford generos generosity for ourselves to have that, then maybe we are able to have the same generos generosity towards others. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. No, I think that you've just kind of uh, uh, reminded us of the importance of self-care. And I think we've been, in a way, hearing a lot more about that because of the pandemic uh, lately. Um, and um, think, and and maybe hopefully that will also um, give us some time to think about how we can take care of ourselves in order to care more for others rather than in a, you know, uh, self-centered, uh, take care of ourselves in a, in a self-centered and very um, uh, 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 egotistical kind of, kind of way. Yeah, um, I, I have another question that um, I think is quite interesting, so I'll just uh, pose it to everyone. Do you think uh, ecofeminism can include religious practices like shamanism or animis animism that is deeply rooted in Asian traditions? Um, Esther, perhaps uh, you want to take that question first? Okay. Yeah, I think that, you know, all these are labels, right? You know, ecofeminism is, uh, I mean, it was a recent label in the 70s uh, when, you know, certain things were gaining uh, traction. So I think these, kind of, these kinds of ways of living, let's say, with reciprocity with, uh, on the, uh, towards the earth, with care, with love towards the earth, um, these practices have existed for a long time, especially in indigenous tribal communities. And we see this manifested, right, in uh, what we now term as animism and shamanism. So I would say that all these are actually um, related, you know, these, these uh, practices or these, if you want to call them religions, I wouldn't call them religions. I think I just call them beliefs or philosophies. Um, I think they draw from the same, uh, from the same well of, uh, of caring for the earth, you know, and it's also quite, um, I, I would say, quite logical because um, the people, the communities live, lived very closely with the earth, right? So they would have to therefore look after the earth because let's say um, if they look after the seals uh, and they ensure that the seal population is, uh, you know, uh, healthy, then they're able to um, live well because then they depend on the seal for sustenance, for food, to keep them warm, you know, for clothing and all that. So I would say that it's really um, this, this closeness and this kinship with the earth and whatever you call it, shamanism, um, animism, um, I think was is founded upon um, this very notion also that in order to thrive, you know, I need to look after um, the other, right? I need to look after the other because the other is a part of me, right? If if the other is uh, does not thrive, I do not thrive. So I think there's this very close connection and intimacy to understand that the self is the other, and the other is the self. So I think this separation is something that. We, we are now dealing with, you know, in a more modern context, we live in terms of separation, we think in terms of separation uh, of the self from the other, of, of human from nature, right, Cult nature, culture kind of divide. So yeah, I, I, I think that, I'm not sure if this answers the question, but I definitely do see similarities across these uh, philosophies or these um, beliefs and practices. And I think ecofeminism is just, uh, you know, it, it just uh, focuses a little bit more on, on the women, also because of the cultural context, right, in which uh, ecofeminism arose. Yeah. Thanks, thanks very much, Esther. Um, maybe Noor has something to share also, because uh, I think your artistic practice deals a lot with, uh, uh, I guess, traditional uh, beliefs and, and practices as well. Uh, maybe something about the samangat. Thank you. Um, I think 
Uh, well, I mean, uh, my introduction to, I guess, uh, eco-spirituality was through, I guess, drum circles and healing circles and sitting in, um, uh, listening to, I guess, uh, practitioners uh, who have traveled the world and then coming back to Singapore and sort of sharing the knowledge that they, they, um, they've learned. Uh, and most times I feel that uh, um, while there are many elements that I can relate, I think that the most spiritual thing that I can do for myself is to go for a two hour walk in the park. Uh, and uh, Google Lens is actually our best friend. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of, um, I mean, uh, I think recently there has been a, a trend in, uh, maybe you want to call it a trend or rather a, a, a increasing consciousness in foraging, right? Uh, especially in Singapore where for, foraging is illegal. Uh, I think that learning, uh, I guess, um, the type of plants that are already available and around us is such a great way to to know uh, to know I guess uh, your friends on earth who are not uh, humans uh, like for example um, the, the 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 mukum rasam am I pronouncing pronouncing it correctly the the fruits that look like cherries that are so that are just abundant along the streets of Singapore and um, I see birds eating them all the time. And I'm wondering, can I eat them? And then only recently, maybe last year, uh, on Channel News Asia, I found out that you can eat them. Uh, and for me, I mean, it's such a simple, uh, it's such a, it's, it's, it's there, it's there, it's hiding in plain sight, I feel. And, uh, and I think maybe the most spiritual thing we can just do is to, to pause, to walk, to pause and look. Uh, there's this quote by uh, Jenny Aiko, if you talk to the plants, the plants will talk to you. And I think um, maybe the plants haven't talked to me yet, but they, they call me, they, they, they call me to look at them. And I think that's one way, uh, one simple way that I've learned to be spiritual uh, in a way that, that makes sense for myself. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, I, I think I, I get what you're saying also about how being open maybe is part of that uh, uh, sp spirituality or, or communing with uh, nature. And when you talk about foraging, I thought about the forest uh, bathing also that's quite, um, uh, I, I guess, trendy uh, uh, nowadays. Um, and uh, Serena, do you have anything to add about uh, to this question? Um, I think I echo what Esther said, and I, I love Noah's approach. I never knew foraging was illegal in Singapore. Um, but I think the, the question that came in sort of also demonstrates how if we talk about shamanism or animism or paganism, the labels are, are derogatory to an extent because, you know, with no offense, organized religion, we see this as primitive and backward. Um, and, and to engage in this is, is like not being civilized. And I think this is sad. I'm all for traditional knowledge, traditional practices, um, traditional engagement with nature. It has to be said, however, of course, that not on all indigenous people, not all traditional peoples are pure and perfect and kind. But I think, you know, to some extent, to a large extent, their engagement with nature is the pathway that we need to refine. Um, if, if you look at Wicca as, as a practice, um, people, whether by sea or by land, they are very engaged with nature and their surroundings. And that is also something that they always connect to the female because of that bond with what is natural, um, because of the ability to procreate, etc. So I think if we're talking on eco-feminism terms, then refinding that that natural closeness to nature um, is essential for us to save the planet for us to do more for to combat climate change i think more and more as we become more developed more civilized you know as as we engage with capitalism as as Noor said we lose that i think i see that in singapore where everybody's so comfortable and and in air conditioning that you know we we forget that singapore's an island and we have sea all around us and, and there is pockets of nature that we can go out and touch and feel. Most people don't want to step on grass and don't want to walk on a trail that doesn't have tar. 
And that means we've lost that connection. So I think refinding that connection can go a long way um, in helping solve all the problems that we have. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Serena. I mean, I really hear you when you say that, uh, um, you know, we should validate uh, Indigenous knowledge uh, uh, that tra traditionally has been dismissed, uh, but at the same time, not overly romanticize uh, that as well. And I, I, and I, I totally agree with, uh, with you on that score. I also wanted to say something, actually, I suddenly remembered what Noor was saying about uh, knowing the names of things. And uh, we have an essay in our collection also about um, learning the names of birds. And uh, so I, I, I thought that was uh, uh, very timely that you mentioned that. And it's perhaps um, back to that whole idea of uh, also self-care and taking time for ourselves. One of the things that we can also do actually is perhaps equip ourselves with knowledge, more knowledge about uh, our natural uh, surroundings and about the environment. Perhaps most of us in, in Singapore just, you know, never go beyond primary school or secondary school science in knowing the, the names of things around us. And, and one of the things that perhaps we could do as individuals, not no need to rely on, on the state or the government for that, is to uh, empower ourselves by um, knowing more, taking that first step to know uh, our environment um, better. Okay. Um, Esther, I think the, there's one last question that has to do with our editing. And so I thought maybe we could take that. Um, and uh, the question is about how the topics of the essays in our collection are very varied and uh, what were some of the challenges in uh, choosing essays, you know, and deciding, having to decide what counts as ecofeminism or, or, or what doesn't. Um, would you like to go ahead first and then I'll, I'll, I'll chime in later? Okay, yeah, so um, it is true that the essays, that the essays, the topics are quite broad. Um, I think when Angelia and I were working on this, uh, on the brief for the open call, um, we were very clear that we wanted to be as inclusive as possible. And we also wanted um, to include stories whereby, you know, the contributors themselves, maybe they were not aware, right? They themselves might not be aware that, oh, what I'm doing is actually uh, actually an example, right? A manifestation of an eco-feminist um, practice of care, of kinship, of kin making. So I think that's why you will notice that the essays really range from, let's say, um, an eco-spiritual approach, for instance, to relation men's uh, humans' relationship with uh, birds that they live, uh, you know, that inhabit the space with them, to let's say contemplating the idea of home, uh, a house, what it means to feel at home, and also to um, think about. Um, let's say a more eco-activist point of view about uh, movement work and care as well in movement work. So yeah, it really um, does show us, I think shows the reader as well as the contributors and us editors that um, it's all around us, right? In terms of um, the decisions we make, in terms of our everyday lived experiences, in terms of our personal lives, we can and we in fact are participating in an um, eco-feminist um, practice of care, of kinship, of reciprocity. So I think, um, yeah, it, that, that was uh, intentional, yeah, an intentional approach. Yeah, uh, so just to, to say that uh, I agree with Esther. I mean, that was a good summary of uh, the approach that we took. Uh, the emphasis was always on inclusivity, uh, wanting to hear a range of voices um, from, you know, all over, uh, all, all, all uh, different uh, uh, women in Singapore. Um, and I also wanted to add that I think some of the essays uh, uh, perhaps treat space uh, in a more uh, symbolic and metaphorical way. So so not necessary. So in terms of, um, let's say, the environment uh, and in terms of also having a kind of mental space or the space of memory. So, so some of the, uh, some, some essays may not directly engage with um, uh, the environment, uh, the, the natural world, uh, whereas, but, but many of the other essays do. But at the same time, I think it's very important to recognize that um, uh, the, the space may, may, may be very real to us, even if it's uh, symbolic. Like one of the essays uh, talks about the wilderness, but it's very much the wilderness as a, a kind of symbolic metaphorical space. Um, at, at, rather than the natural uh, kind of wilderness that um, most of us might assume. So I think that uh, you'll find that, that the essays cover a wide range of um, 
topics, ideas, issues. Um, but I, I hope that you'll be able to see uh, commonalities in terms of uh, how everyone uh, is advocating in a way, um, uh, caring for others, for their communities, uh, caring, uh, caring about the past, caring about uh, marginalized views, uh, marginalized uh, peoples, uh, and really asking all of us to rethink our role and our position, uh, perhaps in Singapore, and depending on um, also what you do, uh, and maybe just uh, reflect a little bit more uh, about that. Okay, um, right, so I think that we are nearly running out of time, so I'm going to just uh, end our panel discussion, uh, and thank you Esther, Noor and Serena for joining us uh, today, and I hope that uh, we managed to give a, a flavour of uh, what the collection is about to our listeners and, and uh, to people uh, uh, tuning in. Uh, I really uh, am uh, very proud of this collection uh, and of everyone's essays and I really hope, uh, I can't wait for people to actually read the essays and to find out what they think and hopefully um, uh, the essays might even uh, transform some people uh, and uh, what, the, what they do. Um, I think I'm going to uh, pass the time back now to uh, Eric so that she can wrap up the session. But thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we've come to the end of the launch of Making Kin. Thank you so much, everyone, for this like, fruitful conversation. I enjoyed it so much to hear from everyone. Um, to those listening, uh, you may share this event uh, and follow Ethos Books on Facebook if you'd like to be kept in the loop for similar events. And if you want to hear more from our speakers, um, Noor will be speaking on an SWF panel tomorrow uh, at the Singapore Writers' Festival. It's called Futurism and Mysticism, the Evolution of Malay Speculative Fiction in Singapore. So that's happening tomorrow, 7 November, 5 to 6 p.m. And Esther Vinson, alongside with other Making King contributors, Arundita and Diana Rahim, they will be speaking on an SWF panel called The Language of Ecology, Lessons for the Eco-Crisis. So that's happening on 14th November, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And if you'd like to purchase a copy of Making Kin, you can go to Ethos Books website or you can go to uh, bit.ly slash Making Kin. I think all the links are in the Facebook comments. So thank you so much again for joining us on this Saturday morning. Um, take care, everyone, and till next time. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. everyone.